say something before everybody? Please. Just that I'm so grateful for being here, shocked that I'm going to be the age I'm going to be soon, but um, very happy to be here and, and to thank all of you for making it possible for this program to occur. It's really wonderful. When I get used to it, I'll think that. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. I mean, it's it's actually a program that I think is not only interesting and illuminating for the person being interviewed, but obviously for the rest of us. And I can't tell you how many times after these, the people have come to me and said, wow, that was, you know, I didn't know that about that person. That was really interesting. Um, and, you know, we sit next to each other maybe for years and really never are able to get into the kind of background, the kind of details that in everybody's life is, is interesting and fascinating. So we're doing that. Uh, and we do that with a person of a certain age um, here. Um, 83 is the, the, the year that we usually uh, honor, uh, do this program. And we're here with Patty Iglarsh and um, welcoming her to us. So why don't we just jump right into it, Patty? And um, First of all, I like to start with parents. And I know that in your bio, you, you started with your parents and your grandparents and so forth. But for, you know, briefly, and again, we have about a half an hour to condense a lot of information into this. Um, so um, just give us kind of an overview of who are your parents, where did they come from, and kind of how, what kind of an environment did they create for you when you were growing up? Sure, yeah. I started to uh, speak, but thank you very much, by the way. Um, you've been just really fun to work with, and I really, really like that. We've enjoyed talking about Chicago. Can you hear me? Maybe bring yeah. a little more to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Try not to move my head. I mean, point it. <clears throat> okay. This will be very <laughs> difficult. Maybe. You got it. Just, just you okay. Know, I'll, just, right I'll just do that. Okay. If it, if it changes direction, which is likely to do, uh, let me know. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, Jeff and I, it turns out, have lived in Chicago. Uh, I was born and grew up in Chicago. So to go a little bit further back though, I started when I wrote my autobiography uh, for, the, for the social solidarity, I wanted to um, go back and talk about my parents who really never had anyone write an autobiography for them. They never wrote a biography for them or write their own autobiography. So I feel in some way that I'm, I'm uh, doing this for them in a way to let them know, uh, let other people know about what their lives were like. I started writing this about uh, a, just a week before the war started in uh, Ukraine or started with Russia starting the war in Ukraine. And um, I was pretty amazed by the coincidence in a sense um, that here are my two parents, my father born in Odessa, outside of Odessa in a small town, uh, right outside of Odessa in 1902. And my mother, not born in the old country, born in Chicago as the first child born of the family uh, in the United States, they had had other children coming with them when they came from Belarus. And then my mother was born in 1908. And I knew these dates for years and years and really never thought a lot about how long ago that was as, as getting to be more and more in the distant past. And suddenly when the war started and all these names came out, all these, all these places, um, I started reading up on the best, some of the background where the families, what they would have encountered and, uh, or might have encountered, uh, who knows. But in Belarus, for example, my mother's family, I know more about them because of my cousin Charlotte, who was very kindly involved in doing a real genealogy a real search. And um, she found out the name of the town where they had been born, the, the parents, not my mother, but the parents, her parents and grandparents. And I don't know how far back, but it was a town called Ostrashitsky, which still exists. 
uh, today is outside of Minsk, about 12 miles. And my father, who I have, who's background way back, I have no information about, um, but joined Ancestry. You asked me about that, Jeff. Why, why did, what, what's this with Ancestry? And I said, uh, I didn't really answer you, but I, I think I had in mind that I was going to try to search for more information about my father's family. Um, and I've gotten so busy and too much involved in other things. I haven't done that kind of research yet, but it's on the, it's one of the things that's on the schedule to do. And uh, he was born in 1902. There was a pogrom in, in Odessa, a terrible pogrom in 1905. Uh, whether or not that had any influence on their coming to this country in 1912, uh, probably yes. Um, people were trying very hard to leave those places and they left them in the millions and certainly many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, it, the aggregate number was something over a million came to Chicago in the decade between 1900 and 1912 when my father would have come. So my father's story is this. He, early on, he came from a family whose parents, my grandfather, Sam, was a uh, I think he was a, a guy who really kind of knew how to handle. He knew how to get jobs for himself. He felled trees. I knew that. And he had um, my grandmother, I think, set up in an inn where the inn came from. I'm not exactly sure, but that's the story. And I can understand it. She was the one who was the innkeeper's wife. And she... Um, took care of the place, then she made food for the boarders. I think it was like a rooming house because that is really what happened to that, uh, those two people. They, when they came to Chicago, my grandfather, Sam, set up a rooming house in many places along the way. And that's how he made his living. And my grandmother was an excellent cook and obviously very influential on in my life. I come from a family of very good cooks, and that's significant in my life. And uh, my mother's birth was in 1908. Her folks had come in 1904. My uncle, my grandfather, Zadie Sam, had come in, in uh, 1904 and then sent for the, his wife, Bessie Basha, and they came and they set up a uh, home in the, on the northwest side of Chicago, closer to Roosevelt Road, I think we would say. So that's more like the west side of Chicago. Um, it was before my knowledge of the west side. I never had it. They moved to the northwest side and, and both families were on the northwest side. And um, they met my father and mother met in the 20s. But before that, my father was a go-getter. It's the only thing I can say. Um, I knew him later, of course. <laughs> he was a very big go-getter, but he was, he must have taken a note from his father's book, Sam, and he got himself an education fast when he got here. Um, by the time he and my mother had married in 1927, he already was a lawyer. He had gone to John Marshall Law School in Chicago, probably did not have to go to undergraduate school at that time, but how a man could come having just had Yiddish as his first and only language and became a lawyer, I'm just flabbergasted every time I think about that. Anyway, that's what he did. And my mother, equally skilled uh, with English, and uh, went on to become a secretary. They met in 1927 and then um, uh, were married in 1929. Not an auspicious time to get married, you, if you think back about what happened in this country. So they left Belarus and Ukraine, my father, Ukraine. Uh, they left and they came to this country when times were great, but also got tough. 
as we know, in the late 20s, early 29 was it, 30, 31, things started going way downhill. And I don't know if that reminded them of what had happened in the old country or not, but the old country wasn't fancy. We all know that. We know that from our reading and we know, and, and they were not, they weren't impoverished, but they were not rich. They had, they had rather little money, I would think, uh, especially my mother's family, but they made it and they came, they made it over, came to this country and set up, set up families and very nice families. Uh, I still have some cousins that I'm in touch with uh, who live all over the country, a couple of them in Chicago, but yeah. So that's, that's their story. And you mentioned that your father's family's name was Malamed when they were in Europe, but then they came over here and changed it to Miller. Miller. And that was your, that's your maiden name. That's my Miller. maiden name, okay. Patty Miller. Okay. And you lived, you talked about living on the Northwest side of Chicago and um, tell us what that environment was like. Tell us about your schooling. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Jewish life in that area, but just start with the basics here. Northwest side of Chicago. Yeah, right. what, what was that environment like right there? Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I, my folks had had um, their first apartment was on the Northwest side and their second apartment was on the Northwest side. But I, by the time I came along in 1939, I'm not quite 83 yet, just note that. <laughs> when I came along, it was, and my brother, my brother Ross was born in 1932 and I was born in 19, July of 1939. They were had moved to the north the north side, which was, according to my husband Harv, is a, was a step up, way up. And um, I guess my mother thought so too because she had this really big apartment. I allude to that in the in the uh, autobiographical information I wrote up. But they had a very had a very nice apartment. Um, and I went into the orbit of Sen High School, and of course Audrey and. <laughs> and, and you know about what that might have been like because very big public high school at the big time. public high school on the north side. Um, Audrey's mother was there two years graduated two years before me and uh, so she was filling in too about what high school was like Sun High School it was a huge high school graduating class of about 450 people and um, I guess that's not the hugest these days um, but at that time, it was a very big school. And it, you might want to know that um, Bert Tilstrom, if you remember Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, he was a big fan of mine. Those puppets were. Um, he graduated from there. And a few other notables graduated. And a lot of other people, smart people, because education was pretty good. And a lot of highly motivated immigrants, not just Jews, but across the board, highly motivated people to succeed in the new world and, and succeed they did. Uh, so it was very, it became a very competitive school, not only academically. In fact, I think academically, it might've been less so than it was socially. Uh, it was important to belong to clubs. It was important to, um, to just, to just be chosen, I guess you could say, to participate in the social life. And I did do that. But the biggest thing for me in that school was to be introduced to a wonderful choral music director by the name of Mrs. Keats, who um, this, this part of this, my story is not in, um, in this, uh, short version of the biography that I handed in, I had handed in a longer one. And in that version is a story of my incredible choir, choral music teacher, uh, director, uh, Mrs. Keats, who, who really, she had to deal with all of the people, kids who were singing in the choir, all of whom were teenagers. And how do you deal with teenagers? You have a big stick and you whack it on the front you just whack it on the front of the first chair in line and that's how you get their attention. And that's what she did. And the first day I saw that, I was warned, but the day I saw that, 
I thought, wow, this is for me. And she was just an incredible teacher and director. So she was my first choral music director. And from there on, I, I was in love with choral music and still am to this day. So we'll get into the to music a little bit later. Yeah. It's good that you kind of planted that seed. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what Jewish life was like for you and your family and for that community. There, it was, um, you know, a, a high concentration of Jewish families in that in that general vicinity. Can you tell us what that looked and felt like at the time? Right. Well, one thing that was very interesting about the neighborhood when we moved in, it was pretty much in transition, and so in my neck of the woods, which was, I went to Stone Elementary School, for those who care. Um, it was two miles away, two blocks away, rather, from my house. And um, the neighborhood was a pretty mixed neighborhood, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish. By the time I graduated high school, that had changed dramatically. It became a much more Jewish neighborhood. And Divine Avenue was known for having wonderful delicatessens and and uh, mostly mostly restaurants that would cater to Jews keeping kosher, Jews not keeping kosher, the rest of the community and so forth. And um, my family belonged to Nir Tamid, which uh, was on California Avenue. When I was uh, a youngster, that Shul was alone on California Avenue. By the time I left, college, uh, which would have been in 1960, there were probably 25, would you say, 25 synagogues, shtibbles, uh, big, small. It was, it had become the west side moved to, to the north side. And it was a very Jewish neighborhood. And so it was, it was in the air, it was very nice. Um, to have that. And I think my parents had ultimately picked the right spot. But then they moved to Skokie, which was even more Jewish. Amen. So, um, so you graduated from Sen High School mm -hmm. and you went an uh, hour and a half or two hours north to Madison, Wisconsin, University of three hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I've only done that a few times. But um, you, what did you do at Wisconsin? Um, well, I started singing and I started studying, although it wasn't clear which was first in line, uh, but I did do, I started studying and eventually started studying very hard. Uh, freshman year, I just really kind of uh, got my bearings and uh, ended up studying English literature and history and actually studied psychology and psychology of of uh, children with learning disabilities, all of which ended up being ways for me to make a living and to um, to learn. And it was it was a great pleasure. I also studied art history. So by the time I graduated, I had a lot more credits for to graduate uh, than I needed. But I was um, Wisconsin was a wonderful place. It was very cold, um, very cold. But um, my daughter, even who's I hope watching, Debbie, she went to the school and I thought she had grown up here and I thought, oh, I hope you're gonna be okay. Anyhow, it's a very cold place, but a very, very educationally rich place. And I'm so happy that that was the place that I ended up studying and going. And I got my master's degree from there as well. What was it like there at the time for women where women just speak, I mean, in the, maybe in the 50s, women were starting in larger numbers to show up at, to, to get into colleges and so forth. What, what was it like by the late 50s? And you said you graduated in 1960. What was that environment? Yeah, well, I think that, I think it was, it was pre in many ways. It was, if you made your own, it was pre the women's movement. It was pre feminism in a way. Um, those, those who, who had the wherewithal just pushed on. And, um, and I, I think that in, a, in another way to answer your question, 
I think that my um, growing up years and then moving towards my own career um, were impeded in a way at first by not having the women's movement patting me on the shoulder and pushing me forward. And that, I think at that stage, um, I could have used that, but didn't have it. Uh, later on, I had it and hopefully made good use of it, but I had to wait until I came to Washington to make that happen. And then it did happen for me. Um, so from there, you, you had gotten married um, and mm -hmm. your husband then uh, got his PhD and got a job in Iowa, Cedar Rapids. Right. And you went there to teach kids with learning disabilities. I went there with him. With him. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and that was, I was able to get this wonderful job as um, teaching kids with learning disabilities or setting up, actually setting up for the program. Uh, there had been an interest on the part of the federal government to put in place a lot of programs for special needs kids. And one of the things, one of the programs was for kids with learning disabilities. And, but they, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, apparently when I arrived on the scene, I went looking for a job and they didn't have anybody to do, to do anything. And so I said, well, here I am. And uh, so I was able to do that. Uh, and then I did that for about two years, but then I started having my own children. And so it was tough to balance it out. And um, my own children, I hope, who are watching today on Zoom, uh, Debbie and Aaron, they, um, they came along. And so I was, I was um, moving on then to Washington. By that time, I also had moved to Washington. So this is about the mid 1960s right. to Washington. Exactly. Yeah. And um, and as soon as I don't know if it's immediately after you got here, but you started to get into freelance writing, and you said because that was uh, you know flexible enough that you could still attend to your kids' needs, but also make some money and get into some interesting things. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, yes, and that was. One of the things I needed to do, uh, of course, was to find things that would be of interest for me to do. And I was hoping I would be able to do this on a part-time basis. A lot of work that was available in the community for wasn't available for part-timers. I'm sure that I see Sheila nodding her head. And um, it was not so easy to do. And uh, so you, but I persevered and I thought, well, what, what could I do here? Um, I don't know if I exactly said it in that way, but that's how it was articulated eventually in what I did. I, I um, looked around and I thought, well, there's nobody who's doing any kind of um, uh, writing for the holidays, writing about Jewish food for the holidays. What we haven't gotten into was my mother's incredible background and ability um, to, to cook well and very focused on, on Eastern European Jewish food. This was, of course, what she grew up with and what she knew. And um, it was very nice to be able to just walk right into all of her talents and say, now what could I decide on doing here? So I just called up the Washington Post and I asked them, would they like somebody to write about Jewish food? Well, I'd never written about Jewish food ever. But I did that. And they said, okay. And I started doing that. And I did that for a couple of years. And also at the same time, my former and late father-in-law uh, was a, was a um, botanist and very uh, an outdoorsman uh, who loved and a great gardener. And he would bring stuff over to the house and he would ask me, why don't you make a this out of that or whatever? So I was doing a lot of cooking. So I had a lot of non-Jewish food that I could write about too. And I started writing a, a story about him bringing over all this stuff for me to cook. And that, that was the first long story I wrote um, and it appeared in the 
in the uh, Potomac magazine, which is the magazine, the Sunday magazine of the Washington Post. So that gave me confidence and I had the other, other writing and then I was writing other things. And of course, that was, that was a very good way. It was a very good entree to having a, a life, a balance. Some, I was trying to, trying to make a balanced life between uh, writing, about, writing about food and also taking care of the kids and just, just being able to make some money. And eventually um, I just continued to do that and uh, started doing more and more freelancing. And one thing led to another and- um, Including a, a regular column in the Washington Jewish Week for 15, yep. 15 years on Jewish food. 15 years of, um, at the time, the, the, the same story applied in the, in the uh, Jewish Week, where if you looked at the Jewish Week every week, they were getting, they were getting something over the wire about Jewish food and maybe it was a paragraph long. And I said, this isn't do it justice. We need more than that. And so I called the, the publisher, Joe Hochstein, at the time of the Jewish Week. And I said, how about this? If I did a few articles for you, you could look them over, see if you like them. So one thing led to another. And I got uh, to 15 years worth of writing for Joe Hochstein and the Jewish Week. Uh, weekly. 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 That's a lot of work. It's weekly. At the same time, I was doing other stuff too, but that's the life of a freelancer. And that's how you sort of get going. And, um, and it led me to uh, working for the government. Before we get to that. Okay. Um, All right. I mean, what, what I think is interesting, you were telling me that it, you weren't just like, you know, trying out some recipes and then reproducing them in the, in your column you also did a lot of reporting. You called up people and asked them right. for new ideas about, you know, kind of subcategories of Jewish food, like Iranian Jewish food that mm -hmm. you had no experience right. with. So you kind of collected stories and information. Um, it, it was more than just a bunch of recipes, right? Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean, you, right. you, it was, it was very diversified what you did. Yes. Yeah. And um, yes, I was trying to get a column. If I was going to do this every week, I really wanted to have it be more than just this little squibbit. Uh, I wanted to have it be something that people could learn from. And uh, so I started interviewing people and uh, in the community. And there's so many people in the Washington area and from such diverse backgrounds and such diverse food backgrounds that, um, culinary culinary uh, uh, focus was not too difficult if you just began to see who was who was the good cook in the Iranian community and so forth. And I began to talk to those folks and one thing led to another and I said, this is a really good idea for a book. Um, there was a leap in there somewhere, but I decided to make it and I said, well, maybe I can find somebody to help me publish this book and I did. And so that was the next step in the in the freelance business, where I wrote a wrote a book on Jewish food. I looked it up. Harvey looked up the book a couple of weeks ago. Found it on Amazon. It's still on Amazon. I just looked yesterday. <laughs> Did you? Four and a half stars. Oh, four. So out of five, just so you know. Um, and it's still in print, or at least it's available. It's available. And I, I, the title of it and subtitle, I think, tell you a lot about the book. A Lexicon of Jewish Cooking, a Collection of Folklore, Food Lore, History, Customs, and Recipes. So again, it wasn't just recipes, no. um, uh, and so it was stories about the food and where it came from. Right, right. That's, uh, is there any one big interesting nugget from that book that you, you want to talk that, that is worth imparting here? If not, we can jump to the next thing. I have to now, I have to go go through the file. Okay. And see if I can read All right, that's a long time ago. It was, <laughs> anyway, 1979, so it was a long time ago. Um, let's get to, you were, you were jumping into consulting. And one of the things you said to me was, you know, you've kind of had um, several different, you know, um, births and rebirths when it came to your career. And this was a whole new direction, although it, it flowed from what you were doing before. You started to get into consulting and working writing training programs, educational videos, 
um, for some uh, government agencies. Yes, yeah. right. Yes. Um, so one thing led to another, as you say, Jeff, and and I was fortunate to have uh, somebody come to me who was in a government uh, agency and said to me, you know, we would really, they had seen, actually seen the book, um, the recipe book and of folklore, et cetera. Wow. Yeah, yeah, more than recipes. And wanted to know if I could write this, uh, pub help publish, edit this book, uh, sorry, edit this magazine about intergovernmental personnel programs. Obviously right up my line and, um, well, what do you do? You have to think about it and say, well, did anybody else offer that? Another thing to me in the last two weeks, no. And by this time I was divorced and I needed, I needed um, to be able to keep the show on the road. And um, I said, yes, oh yes, that would be a wonderful topic for me to write about. And I did do it, I was co-editing with a lovely woman who had the nerve to leave what I was doing in a year. The two of us were doing it together part-time. And by that, and that, that bears some um, conversation. By this time, the federal government had a law that it had, and it had been enacted, the Federal Part-Time Employees Act, which really made it possible for people to have uh, uh, have agencies provide part-time employment for federal employees. And that was big because um, it gave opportunities to people who might not have had the opportunities before. And by this time, I was well into that part-time situation, but it was comforting to know that that was available, that was a possibility, and that agencies were being were responsive to it. So um, then she left and I kept on going on my own. And then uh, with a ch big change in 1970, if you remember those years, Halcyon years, uh, wrong, 1980, sorry. Um, there was a big political change and um, that particular program just went downhill. It went, it, it was abolished. And so, um, so I, I guess what you could say is I learned to be flexible and um, I have absolutely, of course, gone from Jewish food to intergovernmental personnel programs. So what could I do next? And luckily I had somebody who had known my work and said, we'd like to have you come and be uh, with our group where it, it was part of OPM and uh, work Office with Congress. Of Office of Personnel Management. Office of Personnel Management and work with Congress. And um, and of course, if you're working anywhere in the federal government, you have some contact, hopefully, with Congress. Um, and I had a lot of political contact only in doing uh, volunteer work, but also in my education. And so I could call on, I could call on whatever whatever resources I had and I could get started and I could go from there and that's what I did. And then I started doing that full time. Then I worked full time mostly. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you worked mostly at OPM, uh, full time, you got benefits um, and you got retirement benefits even though you were consulting. And then you spent the last five years of your career before you retired formally at Brookings. Right. I did do that. I, I, the last five years before, before I left, I was uh, fortunate to be asked to come to Brookings and basically do the same kind of work that I had been doing for the federal government. And um, that, was, that was wonderful. That was so interesting because it was a whole different world for me than the world of government and government consulting. So that was a that was a very different opportunity. So, in a parallel stream of your life, this is about the same time that you met. Uh, you were fixed up with a certain person 
who's in the in the room right now. Talking about tell, the masked wonder over there. <laughs> tell us about how you met Harvey. We were fixed up. This is 1983. 1983. Yeah. And we were fixed up. Um, a wonderful person who had been the secretary in his department at Georgetown said to me, would you like to meet this really nice professor? And I said, okay, say a few more words. And he did, she did. And it was Harvey. And the rest is history, as I say. You were that mar was married in 1985. And, and Ra Rabbi Max Tickton married us. I know a number of you know Max. I, yay, yay. I used to work for Max at the University of Wisconsin. And that was right after I graduated in 1960. And I worked, 61. I worked for the League of Women Voters first. I couldn't do everything. I couldn't smash everything into that bio that I needed to put in. But I worked for the League of Women Voters for a year. And then I went to work for Max for two years. Yeah, so. Um, that was that was 37 years a half it's 37 and a half years ago yeah and you mentioned that you um and and later with harvey were involved in two or three different synagogues in the area um since you've been in dc uh, tell me again what that was oh okay yes sorry for knocking this um yes the I think the most important uh, leap that we made was uh, I was singing with Ramon Tassat in his uh, choir at Temple Shalom, although I wasn't a member of Temple Shalom. And um, I had been singing with Zemra Chai for 21 years. Then I went to sing with him. Um, he left Temple Shalom uh, and it was clear that it, that there was a, a need for a new synagogue who um, that we could we could organize for the benefit of a couple of people, uh, Ramon, uh, to be the cantor and uh, Jerry and his name is running Jerry out of Sarada. my head. Serata, yeah, out of my head, to be the uh, the rabbi. And so Harvey and I became the founding members, among others. Uh, of that shul, which was Shirat HaNefesh, still in existence today. And uh, so we did that. Prior to that, we had been at Har Shalom. I guess you could say we're sort of shul, we had been shul jumpers. I don't think we would jump now. Uh, I think we found our home at last, right? But um, it was a very interesting opportunity for us to know the community, of course, at large and our children. Aaron and Debbie uh, were bar and bat mitzvahed from uh, or Kodesh. So you've you've seen the uh, the whole spectrum. I guess. Made the rounds in Montgomery County. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so get let's get back to the music. And you mentioned you were in Zemmer High twenty one years, a Kolot Alev, which was Ramon Tassat's choir, right? Um, and the New Dominion Chorale, which was more, you know. Um, sort of traditional art and classical choral music. Right. Um, and you also mentioned, I, mean, I think it's a really interesting story that you performed a uh, something called a Defiant Requiem that was uh, conceived and sort of directed by Professor Murray Sidlin, who's uh, at Catholic University. And tell us about the circumstances of that performance, where you did it and what that meant to you. Yeah. I would say that of all the singing opportunities that I've had, the musical opportunities I've had, um, that singing with uh, Marie Sidlin in his program, which he had organized called the Defiant Requiem, uh, was the most moving and meaningful of my, my singing career, singing experiences. Uh, Murray uh, retired but is now the president, I believe, of the Defiant Requiem uh, uh, organization and is still producing what we first produced in 2006. 
which was a performance of the Verdi Requiem in total, plus the commentaries and interviews that Murray had put together of the people who had spent time, a terrible time in their lives at Theresienstadt in Czech Republic. And um, it was called, it's called Terezin now, but it was Theresienstadt. And I'm sure that all of you know some of the sordid, terrible background of Theresienstadt, which was the which was the camp for artists, singers, musicians, uh, playwrights, the camp for artists that the Nazis had put together during the Second World War to, to uh, show the world uh, how good they were in doing this. It, it, it's, um, it in and of itself, just that makes it a horrifying place. And um, Theresien now, Theresienstadt was a, a garrison town on the highway between Berlin and I want to say Vienna. Uh, so it was a, a place where the army would be posted and their families would be posted in the good old days. This would have been in the 19, 18th and 19th centuries. Well, in the 20th century, they had transformed it into a, a, a concentration camp, but it was a quote unquote fancier concentration camp uh, because they had musicians in there, but they were not for the fundamentally allowed to do very much. Um, although there was wonderful work that was produced. Uh, Brindabar was one of, the, one of the operas that was produced at, at Theresienstadt during this time. And Murray, uh, found the story of what had happened with Raphael Schechter, who was a musician who had come, who had been rounded up as a prisoner and had come, had been uh, forced to, to go to, to, to Reisenstadt. And it turned out the only piece of music that he had with him was a copy of the Verdi Requiem. And he would teach the Verdi Requiem from this one piece of music, which, you know, a fairly good sized piece of music um, to the prisoners. And very often, in fact, at all times, eventually all of those people who sang the Verdi Requiem would be shipped off to Auschwitz. And, um, in fact, there was a, a spur of a, of a train track that was available for just that. And so putting together a performance piece was what Murray did. And perf we performed it on the day of the last day of the Prague Spring Festival, and which was a very awesome day in all kinds of ways. And the Catholic University students were his, were his um, from his school who were involved in singing the Requiem and they had asked for older people to come and he, he had asked us, uh, those who could to come and, and adults to sing and sort of beef up the numbers of the people in the, in the choir. So it would have a different kind of sound, a warmer, I guess, a, fuller adult sound too. And so I, I participated in that. And as did Harvey, he, as a non-singer. And um, Mrs. Havel, who at the time was the wife of, of uh, the president Havel of Czech Republic was there to, to uh, welcome us and to eventually say how, how impressed they were with all of this. And it was quite an amazing scene with an orchestra, by the way, from Prague and um, a lot of people who had come to hear it. So that's a pivot too abruptly, but um, I wanted to get time for people to right. ask questions. Um, one thing you made a reference to, but I'd like you to say a few more words about are your children. Right, a reference to, uh, 
Aaron, who's uh, uh, he's a communications person who's been very active on the Washington scene and actually is a designer of, he's a Lego designer, interestingly enough. Lego. Lego, yeah. yeah. And um, Debbie, who is a lawyer, environmental lawyer, living in with her husband in Nevada, in Reno, Nevada. Uh, Aaron and his former wife, Lisa, have two children, um, our grandchildren, and uh, Leah and Nate. Leah's eighth, 18, I can hardly say the word. She's graduating, I can't believe it. And she's going off to college in the fall. And our 13 year old grandson, Nate, who just has bar mitzvah in January. Good. In Virginia though. In Virginia. In okay. Virginia. All right. Um, and then just briefly, um, in addition to your music, you're also an artist and you, after your retirement 20 years ago, you said you took some classes at Montgomery College and really studied a number of different uh, art media. And you said you have something in a show this weekend or coming up soon. It's, yeah, It's going to be, the show starts tomorrow. And uh, I have one piece that was juried into the show uh, at the Glenview Mansion. If you're familiar with the shows that are uh produced by the Rockville Art League of which I'm a member. And the sh that particular exhibit begins tomorrow and goes until the end of June. It's a long time. And what medium is this particular? Paper collage. Paper collage you said is a big, uh, one of your focal points. Right, right exactly, okay. yes. And I started doing it about, I started doing paper collage about 10, 12 years ago. But I started doing artwork. Well, probably I even studied art in, in uh, college and uh, took some silversmithing classes there and so forth, but, um, and moved on uh, to quilting and all kinds of different media until I focused on this one. So you have quite a bit going on. I, I wanted to um, give some time for people here and on Zoom to ask any questions. Uh, anybody here in the room who has a question you'd like to you'd like to throw out, Shana? Well, yeah, and I'll I'll repeat it too. So. Oh. Can you sing something from your choral music? Oh gosh, can you wait and we'll we'll talk outside. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be happy to do it, but I'm not prepared. <laughs> Any questions on Zoom? Rachel? Okay. We put them all to sleep. It's okay. No. We have one question here. Yeah. I mean, the ass on it. I sort of forgot to take it off. You know, you, you get so used to wearing them, you just, they're on. So that was a comment, not a question, that complimenting uh, Patty on her um, Aliyah this morning. Yes. Hopping. Oh, what a nice question. So the question is what kind of congregations, what denominations was she part of in the past and what is it about that Shalom that's attracted her? That's a great question. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, because I'm, I'm too likely, I think Harv and I are, might be too likely to, to pass that over because we've been, most of the time that we've been here, we, it's been the pandemic time. We had this, um, ability to join this congregation, ability is not the right word, to join it right before everything shut down. And uh, so we really uh, have not had an opportunity to spend as much time with people here, but the times that we have had here have just been terrific and we really enjoy being here a lot. And um, that's, that's been uh, quite a pleasure for us really. The uh, other denominations you asked about, 
they're all, they're conservative. Yeah. We do have a question from Zoom. My daughter-in-law. <laughs> What's your favorite recipe? She asked. Ah, my favorite recipe. A Jewish one, ask her or not. Whatever. I know which one. Her recipe. Her recipe for chocolate-covered matzos. I can't make it like she does. Hmm? It's fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. In fact, <laughs> fabulous. Yeah. Very good. Audrey. So the question is about juggling motherhood yeah, and work. It was really in the seventies, mostly. Yeah, late, a little late sixties. Sorry, a little late sixties, late seventies, mostly. Um, just the usual patchwork of people who would come in. Um, since I was working only part time, it made life easier um, that I was part time at home, and that's why I could do the work at night. Um, or as the kids got older, they were in kindergarten or whatever. In fact, they started to go to both kids went to full time. Debbie went to full time kindergarten. Aaron went to half day. But so things began to be easier. But it was a patchwork. It was not a nanny thing. I didn't, I wouldn't have known what to do with a nanny, really. So, yeah. One more question. A couple more. You want to put them both together, maybe? Okay. <laughs> cousin, Harv's cousin. What project? Question is, what project will you be working on next? Wow. Well, as you know, I mentioned if you read read my autobiography um, in Social Solidarity, we travel. We try to travel a lot. We haven't been able to travel very much because, like all the rest of us, because of the pandemic, and we're hoping to go to Italy this summer. Uh, on a ship going along, small ship going along the Adriatic coast. I'm hoping, hoping, hoping we can do that. Um, and I would like to write about that actually, because it seems to be um, a lesser known area. Um, and I might try to do some food things too, because it's not, it's not the, the other side, it's, it's not the other coast, which is more popular. And the you know the Mediterranean coast, and uh, we'll spend a little bit of time in Sicily. I think, just a short time. Sicily has wonderful food. Yeah. So maybe that's going to be it. I'm not sure. I'm going to try to turn my attention, quite frankly, to my artwork, which has been um, uh, I've put aside a little bit, and I'm going to pick it up again. Another question. When did you start your art? I started doing it. Well, I always was doing some kind of thing, but um, seriously started doing it when I when I retired from government and left and Brookings, and that would that's a long time ago uh, now. And so I went, I went really the following year. I started at um, Montgomery College in Rockville. And I started going to school. I, I really didn't know a lot about color or design or, um, you know, the, the, the rudiments and the basics and drawing, charcoal drawing, pencil drawing, all that sort of stuff. I started taking classes doing that. 
And that was really how I got going. And that was, that's really 20 years ago now. It's hard to believe. I guess that's how I got to be this old. There was a second question, Rachel, you said? Yeah, maybe this is the last one. Okay. This is also from Lisa Shostek. From Lisa Shostek. She's great. <laughs> Favorite place. Favorite place. It's a cross. It's it's a contest between Italy and where we've been several times and Antarctica. Antarctica. Which is colder, Madison or Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> now this is gonna really shock you. Well, now you know what I'm gonna say. Madison. Without a doubt, because <laughs> we went to, you go to Antarctica in the summer, their summer, okay, your, our winter, and it was in the 30s, low 30s and sunny. Now you can't get low 30s and sunny in what, in uh, Madison in the winter time until know. April, I think. Right. Oh, one more question here. <laughs> I have it. Everybody says I do. I think, Audrey. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, how did you get rid of your Chicago accent? I would argue there's a little bit of in there. Yeah, but go ahead. If you hear me say my name, some days I say Patty, then you know for sure. And where did you, what city did you grow up in? What city? Chicago. Say it again. Oh, <laughs> Chicago. No. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's the story. So one last question, and this is something that we had asked people in years past, and I forgot to do it last week with Mim, but it's this question that I, I wanted to end with, which is, what do you know now at your at this certain age that you wish you had known when you were younger, or at least that you would like to teach your younger self? What, what have you, what knowledge and wisdom and insight have you? acquired in all this time I thought a lot about this question over the over this last couple of days I, I think one of the things would be practice more practice more um, I I, um, I catch on to music very fast but then you have to polish it you have to do better at it to, to produce it and to perform it and um, I need to practice, always need to remind myself to practice more. That's really important. And I think it's a life lesson too, for whatever you do, um, that you really have to, if you're doing whatever you're doing, you've really got to do it. And sometimes, uh, because I think our lives go by so fast, we have so many things on our minds and so much going on, that it's really easy to just move fast, get whatever needs to be done, done, but it's not necessarily the best. And um, the people I admire the most, I have to say, are the people who, the singers, for example, the opera stars, they're stars because they've really worked hard at it. And you can tell. Like our, that. Like our canter there. Yeah. With with that, uh, thank you very much. That's a, a great learning, a great insight. Thank you, Patty Iglarsh. Um, thank you. And uh, once again, it's always fun to learn about, you know, all these things about you, which we wouldn't have known if we hadn't no, tried this. So have. thank you so much. And thank you, please. I want to just thank you once again, all of you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for doing this, for having this program. And thank you for doing this. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Thank Glad you. Glad you could do it. And I want to acknowledge Audrey Lyon, who also helped with some and of the Audrey, of course. Thank you. That will do it for today. We'll we'll be we'll be talking to Sheila Feldman right here in the front row. What was it, June 4th? Who is who is really excited about it? <laughs> something like first week of June or something like that. First Shabbat of June, she, the, Sheila Feldman. Thank you all.
Thank <laughs> you. 